Are you ready for God's word today? All right, turn with me to what book, everybody? Philippians, that's right. Philip to Philippians, everybody. <laughs> it's going to get worse. Anyways, um, flip to Philippians, and we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. Now, last week, we started out on a new adventure for us, um, and this is something I've wanted to do but haven't done, and that was for us to just take some time and study a book of the Bible together and kind of extrapolate out of it the application and put it in its right context. And part of the reason I, I, I love to do this is to for you to see that the Bible is not just a, this book over here, but it's a part of history. And that, that there's a historical timeline and the Bible is, is in that historical timeline. And, and I want you just to kind of fuse the world. Sometimes like we have the spiritual world over here and the real world over here. And we have Christian history over here and history over here, but it's really just history. And also I want us to understand too, when we put the Bible in the right context, one reason is because I've heard so many, and I'll just be honest, I, let me just talk about preachers. I've heard so many preachers preach things that were wrong and out of context uh, because they were uh, making a big, big assumption that's an error, it's fallacious, because they assume the Bible was written to you. And, and so this is what you need to understand. The Bible wasn't written to you, and it wasn't written to me. The book of Philippians, it wasn't Paul, an apostle to Marty Strait in the Western world in the 21st century. It was Paul, an apostle to the church of Philippi. To the church of Philippi. So the Bible wasn't written to me, it was written for me. And so a lot of times people will grab a verse and say, well, here's what this verse says. But the problem is, that's what the verse says, but it's not what it means. Are you with me? And so I like for us to put the Bible in the right context. That's why I like to try to teach the Bible. The Bible, according to Jesus, uh, and we try to take this seriously, it's why we do grow classes and groups and all those things. According to Jesus, we're supposed to make disciples not church tenders. And so to do that, he said, I, how do you make a disciple? Well, according to Jesus, you teach them the things that I commanded. So in other words, you teach them the Bible. And so that's what we're endeavoring to do. So we're in the book of Philippians. Now, last week, I spent about half the message or so just explaining how we got the book. Obviously, I'm not going to cover all the historical events and all that content today. But I want to encourage you, if you missed last week, to go back and watch that online. For today, here's what you need to know. The church of Philippi was started by the Apostle Paul around 51 AD during his second missionary journey, and it was the first church, first time the gospel of Jesus Christ came to Europe, okay? Because this is technically, uh, Philippi was in Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece, okay? And so Paul was called in a vision. He saw a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come help us. And that's how Paul got there. How we got the letter to the Philippians was Paul was wrongly accused in Jerusalem. This is around 59 A.D., uh, well, really, yeah, well, 58, 57, 57, 58. So around 57, 58 AD, he's wrongly accused in Jerusalem. Uh, he's then in prison. There's a riot. He's imprisoned. Uh, then there's, a, uh, there's an assassination plan. And so then he gets transferred to Caesarea by the sea. Um, and that's different than Caesarea Philippi, but Caesarea by the sea, it's on the Mediterranean. Um, and he's in prison there two years. He has some uh, trials with Felix and Festus. Um, and then he's transported to Rome. He appeals to Caesar because Paul was a Roman citizen. He could do that. So he appeals to Caesar and he's taken to Rome to stand trial and he's in prison there uh, at least you know, two years, two plus years. During that time, he writes four letters, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. And if you want to remember those, the trick is Pepsi. Philippians, Ephesians, Philemon and Colossians, Pep C. I remember them in the order that I think Paul wrote them in, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and then later Philippians. Uh, that just That's the way. But you do what works for you, because I know probably this evening while you're watching the Mavericks win, um, probably your husband's going to look over and say, now what were those prison epistles again? And ladies, you're going to be able to help him, okay? And so, so I just want to say you're welcome, all right? So that's how we get the letter. So um, Paul's in prison in Rome 
you know, probably around at this time it's approaching 61, 62 AD. And the Philippian church hears about it. And so they send a man named Epaphroditus to Rome to check on Paul and to bring him an offering uh, to provide for his needs. Okay. And he writes them kind of a friendship letter, a kind of a thank you letter. It Okay, I can say it's we call it a thank you letter, but he doesn't really go into a lot of thanksgiving, and that has to do with their culture because the Greco Roman world had a patronage system, which meant people of means, if they gave you money, you were kind of indebted to them. And so Paul kind of is saying thank you without saying thank you. And in a way, let me just say it, he's saying, I appreciate what you did, but I serve Christ and not you, which they would have respected, but it was a cultural thing. So it's kind of, so if you ever hear someone say Philippians is kind of a thankless thank you, that's what theologians or pastors or whatever may mean by that. But anyways, he writes them back and Epaphroditus takes the letter back to them. And that's how we get the letter. So today, it, why don't you stand? We're going to read from God's word. Um, I'm going to start reading in chapter 1, verse 27, because to me, that's where Paul transitions his thought. So we're in this series, Joy Ride, that's all about the book of Philippians. And we did kind of talked about Philippians chapter 1 last week. This week, we're going to look at the kind of the main idea, if you will, of Philippians chapter 2. But the transition in the thought starts at verse 27. You, you probably know this, but if you don't, um, there was a uh, archbishop of... Um, I just went blank. Canterbury. Um, his name was, uh, well, I went blank. So there's an Archbishop of Canterbury that first put, he took a, a Latin translation of the Bible, we call it the Vulgate, and he put chapter breaks in, and that was in the 13th century, okay? So it was not until the 13th century that Bibles actually had chapter divisions in, in there. And then it was 200 years later that a French theologian put verses in a, a Geneva Bible. Geneva Bible, And then after that, Wycliffe picks it up, and that's how we got chapters and verses. So when Paul wrote it, it didn't have chapters and verses. Does that make sense? So sometimes when you study it, I say that because sometimes when we study the Bible, maybe you read a chapter a day or two chapters a day or whatever, and that's good. Good, but sometimes when you're reading a, a book like Philippians, don't fall in the trap of thinking it's like a devotional where chapter one was separate than chapter two. It was all one thought and it's all building to something. And like chapter one is building to chapter two, which is built. So chapter one's kind of the mystery of how God works. And chapter two is it's, it's kind of the, the, uh, the model of who we should be and how we should be in Christ. And chapter three is kind of the movement of the believer. And chapter four is kind of the marks of the believer. And so you can categorize it that way, but it's kind of building as it goes. Okay, does that make sense? So verse 27, all that to say, we're starting at verse 27. Here we go. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So to me, this is kind of the introduction to where he's going. So that whether I come to see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Wouldn't that be a great verse of the day? Have you ever seen that on a magnet on a refrigerator? Praise the Lord. It's been granted unto me not only to believe in Christ, but suffer for him. Praise Jesus. Yeah, that's not going on TikTok. Anyways, let me just, can I just, let me say this though, because this is, I think this is good. I think because of, in, in some ways, and I'm not trying to speak against anything, but just hear me out. In the 80s, there was a big push that kind of term now we hear it as the prosperity gospel, okay? And the prosperity gospel seems to imply many times that if I really have faith and love the Lord, I'm going to prosper and everything's just going to go great. And what I would say, I'm not trying to hate on any in particular person. You can send me an email. I probably will bless you. But... I'm just making the point that according to the Apostle Paul, if you're going through something difficult, it's not because you don't have faith and it's not because you did anything wrong. You could actually be doing exactly what God called you to do. 
And he is saying, I'm doing exactly what God called me to do, and I'm in prison, and you're doing exactly what God called you to do, and you've got opposition. So don't buy into the lie that if you're going through something difficult, God doesn't love you, you don't have enough faith, you're not good enough, you're not believing enough. That's all condemnation from the devil. Amen? Okay, that was encouraging. Praise the Lord. Verse 30, so believe but suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. In other words, I'm in, I'm in the, the fire too, guys. Now we get to chapter two. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any infection, infection, affection, that's a totally different message right there. Any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy. There's the word we said joy was a big theme in Philippians. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, through, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That's good, isn't it? Today I want to talk to you about uh, a mental reset. I want to talk about resetting the way you think, a mental reset, and that's going to make sense in just a minute. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the Word of God today. As we open it up, we open our hearts and ask you to speak to us and transform our lives today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated. Here's what I want to do today. I want to walk you through uh, what we just read Um so that you understand exactly the point that Paul is making and why he's doing it. And then I want to give you the application that we can take home with us, okay? So I'm going to spend half of my time at least walking you through what we just read, which is most of chapter two, um, where we take off, he goes in to talk about Timothy and Epaphroditus, and then we go on to chapter three. Um, But I want you to understand it, and if I set it up, then it will make the, the application make sense, okay? So we said that Paul's in prison in Rome and that um, Epaphroditus brings an offering from the church of Philippi, from the Philippians to help Paul. And then Paul writes this letter and sends it back. And so in chapter one, Paul does his usual outline. So a Pauline outline is kind of a salutation, thanksgiving, prayer. Then he kind of gets into the argument or the issues. Uh, and then he kind of goes to a, you know, so that's the body. And then there's kind of the conclusion where he'll get into some exhortations and then, you know, greet mom and them and, you know, tell them I said hi kind of thing. Right. So, um, this Philippians is a little bit different because he gives us a personal prologue. So he kind of gives us that introduction or that prologue where it's like, hey, everybody, Thanksgiving, prayer. You know, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And then, you know, I pray and he prays for them. And then he says, hey, here's what's going on with me. Like, it is true I'm in prison, but it's advancing the gospel. And it's true that people are preaching with poor motives to make my prison sentence worse, but it's advancing the gospel. And he said, hey, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'd, I'd rather just go home and be with Jesus, but for your sake, I probably need to stick around. What will I do? I'm, yeah, I think I'm going to just stick around for a while. I think it's just incredible Paul thought that way. Like, I could just go to heaven right now if I wanted to, but I think I'll just stay, not because I want to, but because you need me to. I mean, it's just wild, right? Then we get to verse 27, and this is where he transitions. And so we, when we read the, the letter, you have to understand, we don't have exactly what was going on in Philippi. We don't have what Epaphroditus told him about the Philippians. We have his letter. So what we do is called a mirror 
reading in theology, which is where you read it, or really it's bibliology, where you read it, and from reading it, you take the context and the clues and everything written, and you construct what the issues were. Does that make sense? So that's kind of what we're going to do together. We're going to investigate a little bit. Um, but verse 27, he, he transitions to say, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. So he's about to tell us how to live. Does that make sense? That ultimately, listen to me very carefully, ultimately the gospel is supposed to change the way we live. That, that if we really accept Christ and receive Christ, become disciples and follow Jesus, our life should change. There's an there's a old you know Christian word, church word we have for that called sanctification. It's the ongoing work in the Holy Spirit and our yielding to Him that causes us to be conformed to the image of Christ. There's a great miss. Uh, it's a it's a wrong uh, conception in our world. Prep, you know. Um, prep, uh, well, I went like, there's a misconception in our world that the way I am is the way God made me. That's true and also false because the Bible says we're supposed to be transformed. We're supposed to be conformed to the image of his son. So what that tells me is that just because I am a certain way doesn't mean that is exactly how God intended me to be because of the fall of man it has impacted my soul. So the work of the Holy Spirit then is to transform me into who God created and redeemed me to be. So when people say especially on a month like this because it is Pride Month, well God made me this way, you have to understand that's a lie from the enemy because if they're expressing God made me this way, and they're exhibiting behaviors that contradict the Word of God, then God didn't make you that way. Okay, well, that went over well. So he said our life should reflect the gospel. That's what he said. Verse 28, what we find is, here's the situation that Paul's talking to. It's true that he's thanking them. It's true that he's, you know, wanting them to know. I think he probably loved the church of Philippi. They were very special to him. I think you can see that in the way he talks about, he, it, the, it gets translated the way I feel about you or my affections for you, but really the terminology there is about how he thinks about them and how uh, they are in his heart. So I think he was very close to them. But what we learn is they're under opposition. They're under opposition. We see it here um, in verse 28, opponents. So in, verse, in chapter 1, you see there are people preaching with wrong motives. You see this word opponents, which is probably the pagan culture. Then you see um, dogs, evildoers, and mutilators, which would have been the type of religious culture. And then you see enemies of the cross, and those are in chapter 3. Those, so you have two in chapter 1, two in chapter 3. The point is they're under opposition, so Paul is calling calling them to unity because the way you win against any opposition is you get unified. Let's do that. That's a take home for you right now. The way you win in your company, you get unified. The way you win in your marriage, you get unified. The way you win in your family, you get unified. The enemy is always going to bring division and we have to strive for unity. Here's what you under, here's what you know. Disunity is natural. It's like the second law of thermodynamics. Everything tends towards, you know, moves towards chaos. So disunity is kind of the natural order of this unnatural world, or you could say the unnatural world of, anyway, you get what I'm saying. So disunity happens by itself. Unity is something you strive for. So he is making that point that, that hey, you got to come together and you have to get unified and I want your life to reflect the gospel. Can, can I say something right here? And, and let me see where that... Yeah, I want to read a verse here while I'm saying this because it's one verse that gets taken out of context about every time that I hear it. So as a personal peeve of the pastor, I'd just like to bless you with some reality. And so um, on this topic of living out the gospel and unity and those things, verse 12, it, it says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Have you ever heard somebody quote that, I'm working out my own salvation? 
You don't have to raise your hand. I, 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 I've heard this a lot where people will say, well, you know, I'm working out my own salvation. And what I realize is you don't understand what this verse actually implies. So let me just, because you're, because I love you and we're in this together. Come on, High School Musical. We're all in this together. You're right. Uh, I have a, I'm a girl dad, so I've watched a lot of High School Musical. Thank you, Mo. Anyways, um, but um. Most of the time when I hear it, let me just say this. Most of the time when someone quotes this, they're actually using it as an excuse to not be conformed to the image of Christ or an excuse or a license to behave in a way that really is contrary to the Word of God. So I've heard people say, well, you know, I, it's all right if I go to the clubs because I'm working out my own salvation. I'm like, hmm, that's dumb. Okay, Um <laughs> And I've heard people say, well, you know, I, I'm not a part of a church, but I'm working out my own salvation. You understand Paul wrote that to a church. You understand this? Again, this is not written to Philip. This is written to Philippians. It is not written to an individual. It is written to individuals, to a house church that was probably sponsored by Lydia that existed of 30 to 50 people that met in her house. That was probably the church of Philippi. And he's writing this and he's saying, let God work out. You work out your salvation. It's a corporate appeal, not an individual license. And by the way, analogous or an analogy, analogous to this would be um, sweet tea. Have you ever had unsweet tea? Like you went to one of those ungodly places that doesn't have sweet tea because we're raised in the South and here sweet tea should be able to be poured over pancakes. Amen. (laughs) But if you get up North and you ask for sweet tea, they're like, huh? And you're like, that's how I know I've gone too far. (laughs) But if you've ever tried to sweeten cold tea with sugar packets then if you pour the sugar in, come on, Def Leppard, pour some sugar. You know you were thinking, I'm a, never mind. Anyways, all right, we got to preach. And the sugar sizzles at the bottom, right? It's been worked in, but you have to work it out. What Paul is saying is just that. He's like, God's made a deposit. He has worked something in, but now you need to stir it until the gospel permeates every part of your life. That's what he's saying about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's like, God has made a rich deposit in you, but you have to keep like kneading dough. You have to keep working until the gospel has impacted every part of your life. So it is a call to be more conformed to the image of Christ. It is a call to more of a discipled life. It is called a calling to more discipline, more faith, more commitment. It is not licensed to, as though we're, it's like when people say I'm working out my own salvation, I'm like, wait a second. Are you telling me that Jesus Christ paid, but you get to be the Lord of your own salvation? It seems contradictory. Okay, anyways, I got to go back to over here because we're out of time. But y'all see what I'm saying. So now you know the context. All right, so, all right. So here's what's going on. There's opposition and Paul is calling them to unity because unity beats opposition. And in order to get to unity, he's like, you have to change your mind. You have to reset your mind. You need a mental reset. Here's why. Because in the Greco-Roman world, humility was a sign of weakness. Preferring others above yourself was a sign of weakness. Thinking about others instead of thinking about yourself was a sign of weakness. So when he's like, hey, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit, meaning thinking highly of yourself, they're like, this is the way of the world. This is how the world works. Not a lot has changed, has it, since the first century church in Philippi, right? So he's introducing. So, so that's why we, we just read it. But verse 27 talks about one mind striving side by side. Verse two, he has it twice, being of the same mind, full accord of the, of, uh, and of one mind. And then verse five, have this mind among yourselves, which is Christ Jesus. To me, this could have just as easily been the theme of Philippians, even though we say joy is the theme because it's in the text 16 times. This word, phroneo, P-H-R-O-N-O-E, phronoe, there it is. Um, That word is actually in this epistle 10 times, 10 times. 
And so Paul is talking to them about, he's like, hey, you're under opposition. You need humility. You have to change the way you think. When Paul talks about this word, um, uh, phroneo, I'm sorry, P-H-R-O-N-E-O, phroneo. I had it right the first time. So anyways, um, like froyo, but not really. All right, phroneo. Anyways, when, when Paul is talking about this, um, what, he's, what he's indicating is this. Not that you need to think Christian thoughts, but that you need to think like Christ. I think a lot of time in Christian, we think, well, I'm supposed to think better thoughts, Christianized thoughts. And that's not bad, but he's talking about the basis, the foundation of your thought. Uh, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? So when he's talking about this mindset, he's like, I don't want you, I don't want you just to think good thoughts about other people or think better Christian thoughts. I want you to change the way you think and to show us how to think. Then he posits Christ. He's like, I want you to think like Jesus. So he's like, have this mind, which is yours in Christ Jesus, right? He's like, I want you to learn to think like him, who the basis of how he existed was to put others above himself. The basis of how he existed was to think about the needs of other people. It wasn't just good thoughts. It was the way he thought. Are you with me? And so he's saying there again, opposition, you need unity, you need humility, humility fosters unity, so you need a mindset that produces humility, that fosters unity, so you can stand against opposition. So then he gives us Jesus as our example, the model of the believer, right? So the mystery, then the model. So the model of the believer. And to do that, starting in verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, right? Or let this mind be in you that you have in Christ Jesus, or that is yours in Christ Jesus. Those are all different translations. Um, It indicates that Christ has provided for us by the Spirit a way to think, but we have to appropriate it, apply it, and accept it. Does that make sense? It is yours in Christ Jesus. So it's available to you, but you have to pick it. All right, we'll come back to that in just a minute, but big thought there. All right, so so then verses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, those verses are not actually Paul's writing. Paul is actually quoting a hymn of the early church. So the early church didn't have a New Testament, especially like in the church of Philippi. These are Gentile believers, so they didn't really even understand what we would call the Hebrew Scriptures or the Old Testament. And if you had the Old Testament, remember the Ethiopian eunuch that was like, I don't know, how would I even understand the book? He had the scroll of Isaiah, so he had the book of Isaiah. And he said, how would I even, this is in the book of Acts, how would I understand this unless someone told me what this meant? And so that was when Philip was caught up in the whirlwind. Philip explained to him the book of Isaiah. So I'm just saying, we look at the Old Testament and we can find Jesus all through the Old Testament. But in that day, that, it would have been hard to see that because we have had a lot of good teaching, discipleship. We have the New Testament that shows us Jesus was in the Old Testament. Are you with me? So the early church used creeds and hymns to preach the gospel and remember the gospel. One of the earliest creeds in the the New Testament church is Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 15. It probably goes back to about three years after the resurrection of Jesus is when a lot of biblical historians and theologians will date it. But it's when Paul says, I give to you or deliver to you what was delivered to me that Jesus Christ was crucified in accordance with the scriptures. And he goes on from there. He's not writing that. He's quoting a creed. Here, he's quoting a hymn of the early church. And this hymn was written. In fact, you can see it. It was written to show us the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Christ. The first few verses, right, when we read it, it says being in the form of God didn't count equality with God. And it kind of takes him to the incarnation and all the way to his life and his 
death, okay? So when we're talking about the humiliation of Christ, we're talking about his incarnation, his life, and his death. Then it goes to the exaltation of Christ. When we talk about the exaltation of Christ, we're talking about his resurrection, ascension, dominion over creation, and intercession for believers. So that's his exaltation. This gives us the humiliation and the exaltation. So this was a hymn they sang in worship to God. Paul is using it it to po- to to um to I use the word posit but to to set Christ as an example for us with this idea of unity and humility of mind okay that comes from a mindset is everybody tracking what Paul's doing here so I just want to show you what's in this hymn and then we'll move on to to the application but it says this though he was in the form of God um didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of servant. And and then verse eight, being in found uh, human form, he humbled himself. So there's that word showing Christ humbled himself. Um, this, This is an incredible hymn because it tells us Jesus was God. And it does that in a lot of ways. So this is, um, what you would call very high Christology, which means looking at Jesus through his deity, whereas low Christology would be looking at Jesus through his humanity, okay? So Paul is showing us he was God because uh, NIV, I like the translation better, it uses the word being, whereas this is ESV, it says was in. Being means he was the being of God. That's what's actually implied, implicit in, in the Greek word there. He is the being of God. But then Paul goes on to give us this word form. And he uses, it's translated form three times. So I know, and I know people are like, oh my God, am I stuck in Bible class? Yes, you are. And it's wonderful. <laughs> He uses what is translated form three times in our English Bible, but it's two different Greek words. So watch this. So good. Um, The word that he uses the first two times, the form of God, the form of a servant, is the Greek word morphe. When he gets to the form of a human, it's schema. Okay? What does that mean? When we hear the word form, we think like to look like, right? Like he appeared in the form of a, right? Well, that means to look like, but that's not what this word means. Morphe means um, the essence, the constitution, the character and nature of. So when the writer of Hebrews says Jesus was the express image of God, That's the concept expressed in this word, that Jesus wasn't in the form of God. He was by very nature and character God. Are you tracking with me? Schema, when it talks about human form, schema is is an outward or a form that changes. So let let me, I'll make this make sense and we'll move on. You are both, okay? And here's what I mean by that. Your schema changes. You were a zygote, an embryo, a fetus, a newborn, a toddler, a teenager, etc. Your schema changed. But your morphe, who you were, your persona, your personhood, never changed. Your DNA was the exact same when you were a zygote as you are now, no matter how old you are. Are you with me? So, So when he's saying God was in the morphe of God, he's like, no, he was God. Unchanging, eternal, he was the essence, he was God. But then he uses this same word for servant. Here's what he's saying. Jesus was never more like God than when he came as a servant. It is a revelation of who your God is. In a world where the gods ruled over and lorded over and used people, He's showing you your God as Jesus, who was God, came and the essence of him was to serve the very creation that had turned away from him. And to do that, he took on the schema, the changing form of a human. Isn't that good? So good. And therefore, God is highly exalted. So let me give you three applications. Are you ready? Three applications. Number one, write this. 
write this down. If you haven't written down anything else, write this down. Number one is that we need our humility is an unconventional mindset. So the, the, the solution that Paul sees is humility. The example is Jesus who humbled himself to death, even death on the cross. And the reason there's that refrain, death, death on the cross, and it distinguishes between death and death on the cross is death on the cross was worse than death. The Persians invented it, the Romans perfected it, and it was like how much we can almost kill you without not quite killing you, so you suffer the maximum amount, that's death on the cross. So he's saying Jesus humbled himself not just to death, but death on the cross. And so humility then is an unconventional mindset. Can we all agree it is not the norm? I told you this, that in the Greco-Roman world, um, their mindset, humility was a weakness. Preferring others was a weakness. Remember how we talked about that? So when Paul is writing to them, he's like, we have to change our mindset to see that the kingdom is upside down and backwards to the rest of the world. So whatever the rest of the world looks like, that's probably not how the kingdom works. Like for instance, in the kingdom, if, if you are struggling financially, what do you do? You tithe. That is stupid. That does not make sense. The math doesn't work out. But yet the promise of God is, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. There will not be room enough to receive, right? In the kingdom or in the world, if someone hurts you, what do you do? You get even. You post that stuff on Instagram. In the kingdom, if it's an enemy, you love them and you pray for them. Upside down and backwards. So he's saying in this world, this is crazy. Thinking of others, preferring others, you know, taking you know, uh, inventory of the needs of others. That's insanity, but that's the way of the kingdom. So he's saying this is not conventional. I'm giving you a different way to think. It's an unconventional mindset. For Paul, he's saying in the words of the Mandalorian, everybody, this is the way. That didn't work as well in the nine o'clock, but it, it kind of halfway worked there. You know, was, these are the jokes. Anyways, but, but here's the truth. We don't, can we just be honest? None of us like, does anyone love humility? You know why we don't like humility? It, because it, it, it's kind of painful. Like I can tell you, one of the reasons, like I, one of the ways God gifted me is I'm real quick with my thoughts, but unfortunately my thoughts can move faster than my, um, my, my mouth can move faster than the governor of my thoughts, right? Like sometimes I don't filter. And so I've been guilty of saying a lot of things in my life that were hurtful to people. And then the Lord would make me go back and apologize and to humble myself and say, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that was painful. Now I try not to say those things because the humility is painful. How many are with me? So now sometimes I just go... Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? We all know that admitting we're wrong or taking the low road or, or like in, in a life when you've been wrongly accused or people are speaking bad about you. And, you know, I went, I've gone through several years of people saying a lot of bad things about me that aren't even true. And it would be really easy to, to take a public platform and say, let me just explain to everybody the truth. And I have facts and dates and data but you don't do that because you have to say, okay, God, you've called me to humility. People can believe what they want to. They can think what they want to. And I, I'm going to let you be my defense and I'll let you take care of me and I'll let you take care of everything. But how many know that hurts your flesh? How many has ever been right, but you couldn't tell anybody? Doesn't that stink? He's saying, hey, this is the way. Christ has established the ultimate moral standard here. And what Paul's actually saying is the, the, Paul measures our confirmation to the gospel by the level of our obedience to it. And he is calling us to walk worthy of the gospel, which means to emulate Christ, which means to have this mindset, which means to choose humility. And please understand, verse 8 said, being found in human form, he humbled himself. Jesus humbled himself. In other words, he made the choice to choose humility. Luke 14, 11 says, for everyone who exalts himself, these are the words of Jesus, right? For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Here, here's the reality. 
Humility works, but we have to choose it. Just like Jesus had to choose, he had to humble himself. We have to humble ourselves. In fact, according to the words of Jesus, we either choose to humble ourselves or we choose to exalt ourselves. And based on what we choose, it determines what God gets to do in our lives. And so humility, listen to me, humility is a choice that we have to make. And it is painful, but it's worth it. Because number two, write this down, because it's an unconventional mindset. But number two, it's a protective mindset. Humility protects you. Humility protects me. Um, C.S. Lewis, I love this C.S. Lewis quote. He says, pride is the chief cause of misery in every nation and family since time began. Isn't that a blessing? But do you see what he's saying? He's saying, listen, listen, pride ruins everything. Because of pride, Lucifer got thrown out of heaven. Because of pride, Adam got thrown out of the garden. Because of pride, Saul got thrown out of the palace. And if we're prideful, we will also miss God's plan and God's best for our life. It's no different for us than it was for them. They missed God's best for their life because of their pride. Pride ruins everything. Pride turns friends into enemies. Like pride ruins relationships and families and businesses. I mean, what we know is what C.S. Lewis actually was saying is that, man, pride's the cause of misery in and, 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 and families and, and, you know, churches and businesses and in our world. Like, like it is the ultimate cancer of the soul. And pride will ruin your life. Um, there's a, a, a scripture, it's a famous one. We all quote it, but most of us quote it wrong. Uh, it's Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride goes before a... We all say fall, but that's not what's actually in the text. It says pride goes before destruction. Do you see that? And a haughty spirit before a fall. Let me tell you how um, toxic pride is. I, I think somewhere, you know, obviously what happened is preachers were preaching. And the reason we quote this scripture is because every preacher says pride goes before a fall. And all they did was kind of compress these two, sta- you know, the two parts of this statement or this verse. But the truth of the matter is, in doing that, we've done some disservice because the Word of God says pride goes before destruction. Listen, you can get up from a fall, but it's hard to put together your life after destruction. And Paul, I'm not Paul, but Solomon, you know, the wisest man who ever lived, he is trying to make the point here that, listen, pride's bad, y'all. Pride will destroy your life if it goes unchecked. So don't have pride because pride, pride messes everything up. James said it this way, James 4, 6, look, but he gives more grace, but he gives, God gives more grace. Therefore, it says, now he's quoting from scripture, from the Old Testament, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then look at this, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil and he will flee. He's actually telling you how to be victorious over the enemy. And he's saying, if you have pride in your life, God can't fight for you. See, we miss this a lot of times, but he says, God opposes the proud. See, a lot of times we think, well, if I'm a little prideful, God might step aside. Say, well, have it your way. But that's not what this says. This says he gives more grace. In other words, when I'm humble, let's, let's go with football. Anybody like football? Hook them. All right, let's go with football. I, you, you know we can't say anything about the Cowboys, so I just stick with the Longhorns. <laughs> Because remember how they're going, the Cowboys are going all in this year. They hadn't done anything. There's, I'll tell you, the, the two moves the Dallas Cowboys could make to have a chance, <laughs> the, the two moves the Cowboys need to make to have a chance for a Super Bowl is they need um, a new general manager and an exorcism. And so those two things, given the, anyways, but let's use football. So he's saying, He gives more grace to the humble. So he's saying, when I choose humility, God blocks for me. I get the handoff, and God is now my lead blocker. How many know that sounds pretty good? See, we think a lot of times, well, if I get over into pride, God just doesn't block. No, 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 no. What it says is God opposes the proud, meaning when I'm in humility, God is my blocker. 
But when I'm arrogant, God gets on the other side of the line of scrimmage and says, I'm going to take you down. Like, do you really want to run against God? I'm like, I'd love to have that defense either in Texas or in Dallas. I, either way, that's an incredible defense. You see what I'm saying? Now, God does that because he loves us, right? And he would rather us fall into his hands than the hands of the enemy, kind of like when David, uh, when David sinned and took the census and God said, you're under judgment because you've disobeyed and you've sinned. Do you want to fall in my hands or the hands of the enemy? And David said, please let me fall into your hands. And so God opposes us because he's like, I'd rather you fall into my hands instead of the enemy's, but you're going to fall because I'm going to oppose pride and I'm going to do it because I love you. Do you see that? And so it's an unconventional mindset, but humility is a, it's the antidote. It, it protects us. That's why he's telling the Philippians, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Notice there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. Paul was ambitious about preaching the gospel. It's ambition that serves yourself. So don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit, thinking too highly of yourself. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves and let each of you look out for the interests of others and not, or the interests of others and not just your own. So here's what he's saying. This shift in this mindset that protects us is instead of conceit, think about serving others. Instead of preferring yourself, prefer others. Instead of looking out just for your own interests, look out for the interests of others. Now apply this because he's talking to a church about how to win. Apply this to our church. Like, here's a way to win, guys. When we love each other and we prefer each other and we serve each other. One of the big concerns I have in the church is it's, it's turned into to a lot of, in some places, in some ways, it's, it's become very consumeristic where everybody's like, you know, the church is almost like McDonald's. It's supposed to serve me whenever I'm hungry and be ready for me whenever I'm hungry. But if I want to go to Burger King next week or just go to whatever, then, then whatever. But the church is called to be a community where we love one another, serve one another, look out for one another, where we're unified in purpose, where we're doing life together. And that, listen to me, protects us in this present age. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because that's exactly what Paul was telling the Philippians. And so humility is the antidote for pride. And so ultimately, humility safeguards our lives. It safeguards our relationships, safeguards our families, safeguards our church. Humility is the antidote. So it's unconventional, right? It's an unconventional mindset, but it's a protective mindset. And then lastly, it's a promoting, promotive mindset. It's promotable. Humility, listen to me, is promotable. So in this, let me, let me say this and, and we'll pull it all to a close. So in this hymn that Paul's quoting, when it goes into, therefore God has highly exalted him and giving him the name that's above every name, and the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, etc. cetera. Um, the word highly exalted is actually, uh, in the Greek, it's like a superlative in that it's super exalted. So he's saying he has exalted him to the highest place possible. And then it says, and the proof of that is he has given him a name that's above every name. Now we think that name is Jesus, but that's not what the hymns actually say and not what Paul says. It's not actually what scripture says. Although nothing wrong with praying the name of Jesus, singing the name of Jesus, because in our culture nowadays, we know who we're talking about because you don't, you don't really meet a lot of Jesuses. You, you will meet some, you know, a Jesus or something like that. But, but we understand the significance of that. But in this writing here, he's saying he's given the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, to the glory, you know, that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's actually the name Paul's talking about, Lord. The significance of that is this, okay? And let me, this will make the point. We'll put it together and we'll be done. That Jesus humbled himself. So God, he, humiliation, exaltation. He humbled himself to the lowest place. So God gave him the highest place. And when it came to giving him a, him a name, it's the name Lord. Here's the significance. The Lord is Kyrios in the Greek. So in the Old Testament, in the original Hebrew, we, we say Yahweh. We don't actually know what God's name actually is because they would not write it and they would not speak it. 
So the, the Hebrews, when, when you go back in the Old Testament, that's why, I'm, like in the Hebrew, it, it, if it's written, they, a lot of the, now they change it all to Elohim, but, but sometimes we put it as Y-H-V-H or Y-H-W-H because for them, the name of God was so holy, you couldn't speak it and you couldn't write it. And so, so it's, we call it Yehovah or Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, Y-H-V-H. But when they wrote, because you remember Paul's writing, right? He's writing in Greek. Paul would have probably, I think Greek was probably his first language because where he was, where he lived and Hebrew was probably his second language. Or it could be Hebrew was in the home, but Greek was in the community because he was um, raised in, in Tarsus. But here's the, the thing I know. When Paul quotes the Bible, he quotes the Greek Septuagint version. And in the Greek Septuagint, when it came time to translate the name of God, they used Lord, Kyrios. So when, when this hymn is composed and the point that Paul is making is that because Jesus humbled himself and took the lowest place, God gave him the highest place. And God called him by his own name, which is Lord. He's in a culture where the Lord is the Caesar, where there is no one higher than the Caesar, where everyone looks out for themselves. And this hymn says, look at Jesus, who was the very essence of God, who humbled himself, took the form of humanity, died the worst death you could possibly die. And then because of that, God has super exalted him and given him a name that is far above every name. He has actually given him his name. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the Lord over Caesar. He is the Lord over any Lord that will come before or after. Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's the point. To the degree that we can humble ourselves is the determining factor to the, to the height that God can exalt us and use us in this age and in the age to come. That's the point. In other words, Church of Philippi, Church of Pathway, individuals, the takeaway is, is this. God has a plan for us and a purpose for us. He has a plan for you and a purpose for you. His plan for me and a purpose for me. And in some ways, our ability to take on the same mind of Jesus and humble ourselves determines how much God can do in and through our lives and how much God can use us, not only in this age, but in the age to come. I don't have time to read it, but Paul makes a reference to shining as stars and lights, and he's actually talking about the age to come, and he's basically saying, Exactly what I'm saying. Our ability to walk and humble ourselves before God, walk in humility. It's, it's unconventional, but it, it does protect us, but it also is what determines how God can promote us and use us in this age and in the age to come. We need a, we need a mental reset. We need a new mindset. And when we walk in that kind of humility, there really is joy. That's what Paul's saying. Amen. Can you give Jesus praise today? I know that's a lot. Hey, Pastor Marty here from Pathway Church. And I just want to say thank you for joining us. And I want to encourage you to get connected and stay connected. And there's several ways you can do that. Number one, you can download the Pathway app and we are all the time offering resources and information on that app for you. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you do, make sure you click the bell so that you never miss any life-giving and life-changing content as we add it to the channel. And then also, uh, make sure you follow us on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook. Look, our hope and heart for you is that you walk in the purpose for which God made and created and redeemed you for. We love to connect people to purpose. We thank you for giving us this opportunity. And if you're ever in Longview or you are in Longview, I'd love to invite you to join us in person each weekend. Listen, I pray God's best for your life. I believe if you follow Jesus, your best is ahead.